Hi, this is Steve Jones with Stephen Wayne Jones' YouTube channel. Uh, it's been a long time since I last recorded a video, but praise God, I'm back. And I'd love to share with you a passage from 2 Samuel chapter 9. Uh, there's an interesting character uh, mentioned here uh, named Mephibosheth. Uh, probably nobody's uh, known anybody uh, named Mephibosheth. It's not the most common of names, but he's a pretty amazing character that we can uh, glean a lot of uh, interesting truth from. Um, so I'm going to share uh, this chapter. I'm going to read it, and we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the kindness uh, that David shows Mephibosheth. We're going to talk about kindness and how that relates to some uh, passages in the New Testament. And then we're going to take a tangent away from the subject of kindness into uh, relating to verse 8 where it talks about uh, Mephibosheth uh, questions David. He says, what is your servant that you should look upon such a dead dog as I? And we're going to talk about deadness and what it means to be dead in the New Testament. And I think that's a very important teaching. Um, it's going to get a little deep and a little uh, theological and uh, may blow over some of your heads but then we're going to end with something very practical and we're going to look at how this chapter connects to the gospel the good news of Jesus Christ and we see a beautiful analogy a beautiful parallel with the gospel message itself um, this chapter is a parallel to that gospel so let me go ahead and read the chapter uh, 2 Samuel chapter 9. Now David said, Is there still anyone who is left of the house of Saul, that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? And there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba. And when they had called him to David, the king said to him, Are you Ziba? He said, At your service. Then the king said, Is there not still someone of the house of Saul to whom I may show the kindness of God. And Ziba said to the king, There is still the son of Jonathan, who is lame in his feet. So the king said to him, Where is he? And Ziba said to the king, Indeed, he is in the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, in Lodebar. Then king David sent and brought him out of the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, from Lodebar. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, had come to David, he fell on his face and prostrated himself. Then David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, Here is your servant. So David said to him, Do not fear, for I will surely show you kindness for Jonathan your father's sake, and will restore to you all the land of Saul your grandfather, and you shall eat bread at my table continually. And then he bowed himself and said, What is your servant that you should look upon such a dead dog as I? And the king called to Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, I have given to you, I have given to your master's son all that belonged to Saul and to all his house. You therefore and your sons and your servants shall work the land for him, and you shall bring in the harvest, that your master's son may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, your master's son, shall eat bread at my table always. Now Ziba had fifteen sons and twenty servants. Then Ziba said to the king, According to all that my lord the king has commanded his servant, so will your servant do. As for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table like one of the king's sons. Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah, and all who dwelt in the house of Ziba were servants of Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he ate continually at the king's table, and he was lame in both his feet. So... Uh, Mephibosheth, we learn a little bit more about him in a previous chapter, chapter 4 of 2 Samuel. And we learn that uh, Mephibosheth became lame because he had fallen, and both his feet became crippled. Uh, must have been quite the fall. 
but they were fleeing um, for their lives because many of Saul's uh, sons were uh, murdered. Um, there was kind of a fight for the power, a fight for the throne. And so Mephibosheth was taken away to, uh, he ends up in this town called Lodabar, and it means the place of nothing, which I think there's some spiritual significance there we may talk about in a minute. Um, but here David is asking this servant Ziba, is there anybody left of Jonathan's sons that we can bless? And this goes all the way back to um, David and Jonathan were the closest of friends. They loved each other. They were um, kind of at the hip, you could say. They were um, so close. And David promised to care for Jonathan and to look after him and his descendants. And so here we see David keeping his promise to honor the, um, the children of Jonathan. So they locate Mephibosheth. He's in this place of nothing, this Lodabar town, and they go and they bring him, and here he sits before the king, and Mephibosheth may be scared. He may think that this is it for him, that he's going to be killed, because he did flee for his life at one time, and uh, being a crippled, um, they weren't uh, handicapped, people weren't exactly honored in that day. Um, in fact, many times they were left to beg and um, wouldn't be uh, even accepted at all. But here Mephibosheth falls down on his face and he is uh, humbled before the king. And David, um, David says that he's going to, first he says, do not fear. And he says, for I will surely show you kindness for Jonathan your father's sake. And so here we see a great act of kindness from King David, and he's showing it to somebody who um, in other situations would have been, um, they would have killed Mephibosheth because he was a threat. He was of the line of Saul. He was Saul's grandson. And so there could have been uh, some sort of um, plan to destroy Mephibosheth. Um, other people may have done something like that, and that's often what happened. But here Mephibosheth is, experiences the, the exact, exact opposite. He's shown kindness. He's shown favor. He's shown blessing. And David says that he's going to restore all of the land of Saul to Mephibosheth. And so here Mephibosheth doesn't just get a place to stay and a place to eat, but he's actually given a great and amazing, huge inheritance from King David. And so David shows him kindness. Um, I wanted to read a parallel passage here where um, Jesus um, in Luke 14, he's going to talk about uh, who should we invite to the table? What type of people? How does Jesus describe kindness and how we should um, invite others in? Uh, Luke 14 verse 12 he says then he also said to him who invited him when you give a dinner or a supper do not ask your friends your brothers your relatives nor rich neighbors lest they also invite you back and you be repaid but when you give a feast invite the poor the maimed the lame the blind and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you for you shall be repaid at the resurrection of the just. So Jesus is giving us uh, kind of some guidance on the type of people that we should reach out to, that we should bring in into our homes, that we should throw a banquet for. And I think he's just kind of pointing out that it's common. Everybody is uh, willing to invite their friends over and their relatives and the people that are rich and that can bless them back. But Jesus is saying, do, go do the opposite. Bless the people that have literally nothing to give you. They're poor, they're blind, they're lame. Um, they couldn't repay you if they tried. And so I think it also relates to the passage in James where it says, pure and undefiled religion is this, to visit orphans and widows and to um, uh, comfort them in their distress. 
he says that James says that's pure and that's undefiled and it makes sense if you're reaching out to a destitute widow or to an orphan who has uh, maybe very little to repay um, then the chances are then that's uh, pure religion because what are you going to get back out of it well they may have nothing to offer you back and so Jesus is challenging us on our kindness are we showing kindness to be repaid are we showing kindness to gain some social status are we showing kindness to um, grow in prominence well if you're inviting the lame to your dinner table or those who are rejected by society around you the chances are is you're not doing it to get a leg up in society so here we see David inviting a crippled a uh, young man, I don't know his age at this point, but he's inviting him to his table to be with the king, to be exalted up to the king's table. And he said, you will eat at my table for as long as you live. You'll be like one of my sons at my table. And so David shows great kindness to this crippled man. Now, verse 8, we're going to kind of take a little bit of a tangent and get a little bit deep in the theological here. He says, verse 8, What is your servant that you should look upon such a dead dog as I? And you run into theology, you run into this concept of being dead. And Mephibosheth saw himself as a dead dog. Um, you could say he was good as dead or he was... Um, maybe just destined to die and couldn't make anything of himself and because of his crippled nature and the way they dealt with cripples he just viewed himself as dead and there are other passages where we uh, see this concept of being dead and um, I wanted to talk a bit about that um, Ephesians 2 is probably the most quoted passage um, where it's referencing um, our state uh, outside of Christ, outside of salvation, and before accepting Christ and um, being regenerated and born again, um, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1, and then again in uh, verse, I believe it's 5, uh, 5 or 6, he's, he talks about being dead in trespasses and sins. Here it says, And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. I couldn't tell you how much ink has been spilled over this concept of being dead. But what I'd like to suggest is that the most popular interpretation being passed around, um, probably any Google search you're going to do, the top 10, top 20, maybe top 30, results is their understanding here is uh, oftentimes wrong oftentimes extremely wrong depending on how uh, how far they run to the mountains with this concept of being dead so you may have heard a preacher say well what is dead well they may say dead means dead and I come back with well what does dead mean you know exactly well, we know what a dead person is, right? They're, uh, they're dead. They have no oxygen, there's no breathing, they, their body is dead and lifeless laying there. And that's kind of the idea that's inserted into this passage is looking at a dead corpse and then translating that to our spiritual condition. Well, what I'd like to suggest is that first of all, um, if you want to take a very biblical, straightforward meaning of what it means to be dead, what you really run into is when you die, you aren't a lifeless, just a lifeless corpse. That's not even true. When you die, according to the Bible, you are separated from your body. You are separated to go and be somewhere else. You're not annihilated you don't cease to exist you actually are carried either to uh, uh, heaven to be with Christ or you're carried to uh, a lot of people say you're carried to Hades to be awaiting judgment 
So you, the person, if you're dead, you don't, you're not actually a lifeless corpse. That's, I don't mean this in any disrespectful way, but you're actually not the, the atheist or the believer in a materialistic world only, somebody who doesn't believe in supernatural truth, somebody who doesn't believe that we have immaterial souls. Basically, an atheist would be the one to say, dead means dead, um, because they see a lifeless corpse and they would say, well, that's it. There's nothing more there. All that to say, when you really look into Ephesians 2, and you think about Mephibosheth saying, a dead dog is I, there's other ways to see this word being dead. I, I was dead in my trespasses and sins. And you can cross-reference this with some other passages where we begin to see dead does mean separated. According to the Bible, that's actually extremely accurate way of understanding what it means to be dead in the Bible. Now, Ephesians chapter 2, if you keep reading and I love this when I first discovered this. I saw how many passages in the same chapter elaborate on the concept of being dead. And it doesn't point us to this corpse, uh, corpse theology. It doesn't point to this lifeless body with no function, no ability whatsoever. It actually points us to separation. The whole rest of the chapter, Paul elaborates on what it means to be apart from Christ or away from God or uh, lost or, you know, there's all these analogies. And the concept of being dead, he's going to go on and he explains that this is an idea of being separated. So let me read just a couple examples here. Um, Verse 12, he says that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. So he's saying you're still alive, but you're estranged, you're aliens, you're without God. There's a separation there between you and God. Verse 13, he elaborates further. He says, But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And so he's saying there's a separation. You were far off. You were distant from God, from Christ. And so we see separation again. Verse 14, he himself is our peace who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation. There is a wall, there is a barrier between us and God. We were dead in our trespasses and sins. We were separated between the life of the living and us as the life of dead. We were, there was a wall that was torn down that meant that we could now be with God, be with Christ. He calls it the wall of separation. Verse 17, he says, And he came and preached to you who were far off and to those who were near. So he's talking to the Jewish people and to the Gentile people, and he's saying, The Jewish people, you were close because you had the law. You were you were there. You you were close to closer to coming to God. You Gentiles, you were far off, but you were preached, and both of you were brought to be one. So he's talking again about separation. And then verse 18, it says, For through him we both have access by one Spirit to the Father. So before there was no access. You were separated from the Father. You didn't have access to the Father. And here he's saying, now both, he's talking Jew and Gentile, you both have access. Verse 19, now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens and saints and members of the household of God. 
So this is chapter two. He just goes on and on and on and on explaining in detail, elaborating what did he mean in verse one and verse five when he said we were dead. Well, he's not talking about a corpse. He's, he's not talking about this lifeless, unable, um, just basically, might as well be a rock. I mean, it might as well just be an inanimate object. That's not what he describes. That's not what the Bible describes really at all. Now, there is one passage where it's often cross-referenced to try to prove uh, the kind of corpse-like theology that's so popular today. And they'll go to John chapter 11 uh, to kind of uh, find a cross-reference where this can even be supported. And what you find in John chapter 11 is you find a literal dead guy. And yes, Lazarus did not work to come alive, um, but Jesus is not drawing. This is an actual story of a dead guy who was dead for three or four days, and he literally, his body came back to life. Well, you can't insert a theology into this chapter that this isn't about. Uh, it's not explaining. This is how salvation works. Um, Jesus did raise a guy from the dead, and Lazarus didn't really do much to come back to life. But I think if you carry this narrative story into um, making theological conclusions like this, you just, um, you're really being irresponsible with the text is what you're doing. Now, I think there's a better place to find a cross-reference, much better place, and that's in Luke 15. Here, this is a story talking about how salvation works. This is a parable where Jesus is giving us an example of how does this salvation thing work. And what we find is the word dead is used much in the way that I'm trying to advocate for, that I think the scriptures are really communicating. And here in Luke 15, we read the parable of the lost son. And what it says is that the son was dead and now he's alive. He was lost and now he is found. Now he wasn't dead, literally. He wasn't a corpse. He was out eating pig slop and he was alienated from his father's house. He was separated. He was far off. He was, um, he was as good as dead, like Mephibosheth says. How are you going to help a dead dog as I? And so we see this thread um, of being dead and that concept of being separated. We see it uh, metaphysically in what it means to be dead. According to the Bible, we have an immaterial soul. We see it used um, in the sense of being good as dead. We're destined for death outside of God, outside of Christ. And so we can say we're as good as dead. Um, we can use the word dead to mean separated um, from God, alienated as foreigners, as strangers. And in context, and according to these cross-references, that is the correct definition of what it means to be dead in trespasses and sins. And so I just wanted to throw that out there. I don't know if that was too technical, but I do think it's important for theology's sake, and theology does matter and um, I'd like to encourage and challenge you to look back at those passages. If you've always been taught that dead means dead and we're corpses and we're totally unable to respond to the gospel, well, the Bible is very clear and it says that the gospel, the good news, the gospel is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes. And so if you hear the gospel, that that is powerful, that is sufficient, that message of truth is sufficient to bring salvation to everyone who believes. And so belief is uh, a required, uh, trust is required um, to come to faith, to come to be uh, born again, to, to receive salvation. So. Going back to this chapter, 
chapter 9, 2 Samuel, I'd like to end with just kind of showing how this is a picture of Jesus. Um, we can see the gospel message I was just speaking of here in this chapter. See, we are like Mephibosheth. We, um, we don't have anything to bring to God. We, do, we don't have, uh, compared to God, I mean, what are we, right? Compared to Almighty God, well, we're full of sin. We're, we're full of um, selfishness. Uh, oftentimes, there's, there's good things that we may do. We may have shining moments here and there. But if we really stood before God, we are guilty before a holy God. And so, do we deserve to uh, be shown great mercy? Do we deserve to be shown great grace? Absolutely not. We are like the prodigal son who've squandered uh, our inheritance. We've, uh, we've sinned against God. We've violated His law. And so uh, we need to come like Mephibosheth where we say, Lord, what would you have with us? A dead dog. What would you have with us and realize that the beauty of the gospel is that God calls the humble. He calls people who are willing to admit that they need God. And those people, he's, He freely gives them a seat at the highest table. He gives them a seat at the king's table. He gives them a great inheritance that they didn't deserve. So here we see Mephibosheth is given an inheritance, he, he's given a seat, he's given food, he's been given great favor from the king. And Jesus Christ invites people to be a part of his banquet table. He's inviting you, he's, inviting, he's invited me to be a part of his great table. And so I'd encourage you if you haven't trusted in Christ or you think you have in the past but you just don't see any change or that there wasn't anything really significant taking place in your life, then, then maybe you hadn't trusted Christ. Maybe now's the time to truly um, give your life to Christ and to enter into a relationship with God through faith and trust in Jesus Christ. I invite you to make that decision. Um, that's all I wanted to share from 2 Samuel chapter 9. If you would, uh, please like this video. Uh, please subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. And go ahead and give it uh, a thumbs up or write a comment down below. If you have any further questions, if you think I'm wrong, if you think I'm crazy, uh, just leave me a note. Go ahead and write it in the comment section. I'm not gonna disable the comments for fear of being challenged uh, of what I believe or what I think this says. I, I invite those challenges openly and I would love to talk more uh, with you about it. So thank you, God bless you, and have a wonderful day.